all the predation effects come in. If you've got density independent effects on per capita survivorship due to harsher or less harsh environmental conditions, you've got all the abiotic drivers coming into natural mortality. Detecting changes in M is really hard in an assessment because in the short terms, M is always confounded with F and it's really appealing to attribute increases and decreases to changes in F and think, oh, we can deal with this by adjusting catch. And if it's a change in M, adjusting catch is the right thing to do, but it doesn't help you deal with a problem and fix it. Now, the short-term variance in M from year to year doesn't matter all that much. The species by species differences in M can, marry a, ma can matter a lot to figuring out what the sustainable exploitation rate should be for the suite of species being impacted directly or indirectly by fishing. But there's a lot of really nice work on life history theory, size-based modeling and stuff. And I would expect some of the people who've done some of the best work, like Simon, may show us some of it um, over the next couple days. Step changes in M, other than life history related differences in M, can be really important. This played a major role in what happened to the Canadian cod stocks, as I'll show you in a minute. And this is often where a lot of the changes in ecosystem productivity show up in the analytical parts of the assessment as changes in the per capita survivorship of the population. Now, this is an area where science needs to really, I mean, these are not easy problems to study, but we need to do a better job of studying them. This is survey-based estimates of total mortality of the Newfoundland cod stocks. And I've done it intentionally in two different figures because there was a break in the survey series, the type of analyses that were done. I could have plotted the time series on one plot, but it would make you think that they're exactly, that they're comparable. They're not. There's so many differences in data sources. What they do in both cases is estimate total mortality from surveys. It's a noisy estimate. People who work on survey-based Zs know that. But there are some really remarkable trends here. The more, <coughs> yeah, there it is. The moratorium on fishing on, Canadian, on Newfoundland cod was introduced here, come on, there. Introduced in 92, lasted until about 98 or 99, depending on what you call opening of fishery. Over that time, there was a steady increase in total mortality when fishing mortality really was very, very low. And if you look at the axes over here, this is not 0.2 that you expect M of a gadoid to be. That is what, 0.8? And in this analysis with a different data set, it's even higher. Goes down through the 90s, up a bit when fishing occurs, now it's finally gone back to the point where you heard it first here, there are signs of increase in the Newfoundland cod stocks in the last couple years. But these signals in the total mortality of a population and the absence of fishing, even if these are relative Zs, not absolute Zs, these are big signals in population dynamics. And we start off in 2002 with 42 different hypotheses for what would be causing this. We have that whittled down to eight now. Um, and of the eight, seven of them have flippers. Um, <laughs> but we won't go there. Um, nonetheless, compared to variance in growth rate, aside from that issue of overestimating the yield from large um, cohorts, variation in recruitment, those kinds of signals are dwarfed by these kinds of trends. And we're not doing very much to understand them. If you're interested in the environmental forcing on community and population dynamics, 
This is where the questions that plague management are located, and this is where science has to start coming up with some good answers for is M changing? If it is, how much, what direction, and what's causing it? And just to show you, it's even though we've got a decrease in Newfoundland, you go down to the southern <coughs> Scotian shelf, where M had been low for a while, whoops, even though fishing mortality has been low and pretty stable, total mortality, notwithstanding the noise in these annual estimates, is clearly showing an increase. And this stock is now at record low levels and declining with quite low <coughs> fishing on. And again, it took us about six years from the early part of this decade to now to get a handle on the fact that this trend was occurring. By the time we caught it and understood, understood at least its existence, let alone its cause, management was already in really deep doo-doo. Um, in addition to the points I've made about the things we need to know about environmental forcing, we need to use what we know a lot better. And I'm going to, this is another area that got cut back a lot in the talk. But just as an illustration, it's easy to find lots of papers which take your classic stock recruit model, whether it's a Ricker or a Beverton Holt, and we're going to put an environmental term in it to capture the effect of environmental forcer X. Pacific decadal oscillation, North Atlantic oscillation, temperature salinity, whatever. Let's put an environmental term in our stock recruit model. Basic thinking about the numbers and the processes we're dealing with would make us know that's a really dumb thing to do. Why is it a dumb thing to do? Let's just look at change in population size as a function of how big the population is. One of our basic population dynamics equation, not fisheries, this goes back to the 1920s or something. If you've got a big population, unexploited, near carrying capacity, whoops, the N over K term is close to 1. The only environmental signals that are going to affect change in population in some important way are environmental signals that affect K. Affecting R when 1 minus N over K is close to 0 aren't going to be a big signal. But if you've got a population that's been really heavily exploited, brought down to 30%, let's say, of virgin biomass, or 30% of carrying capacity, then those same environmental signals that are affecting K are going to have essentially no effect on dn over n, dn dt over n. The things that are going to affect changes in population are going to be things that affect the per capita survivorship and rate of increase. So the mechanisms by which the environment affects the stock dynamics are completely different if the stock is large compared to carrying capacity or if the stock is small compared to carrying capacity. And fitting a single term in a Ricker or a Beverton Holt stock recruit model to capture that is probably not a real wise thing to do. We've got a whole lot of really sophisticated engines for doing management strategy evaluations right now. They're lagging behind in actually doing this work seriously, though. This was a review done about three years, 2005, four years ago now, of all the IC's work on management strategy evaluations. And you can see taking anything about the environment into setting the objectives, so you might have a different objective in different environmental regimes, nothing. Putting environmental forcing in the operating model, three out of 14. Putting environmental considerations into the robustness testing step, one out of 14. And it's just not getting done at the rate that we're using what we know. 
switch gears now. Look at the environmental effect of forcing, uh, the, the footprint of the environment, the second of the FAO standards. Gear impacts, bycatch, trophic impacts. I mean, this is old news. We're hearing songs we heard 30 years ago being replayed to us. Um, the questions to really sit back and deal, uh, did I have, yeah. This is how long ago we were dealing with these issues, some of the major benchmark works. Um, there's a single factor question. What level of impact is sustainable? It took us a lot of work to get that right for target species. How do you get it right for bycatch, habitat damage, and stuff like that? Turns out we've got the tools we use for single species fisheries assessments of what's sustainable that can be generalized very broadly and they don't require tons and tons of data. There are some more difficult cross-factor questions though. How do we calibrate sustainability of impact on one species, one ecosystem feature, bycatch of seabirds, with the sustainability of impact on another ecosystem feature. Habitat changes to the structural three-dimensional diversity of the habitat. That calibration question is a tough one. But in terms of sustainable trade-offs that are equitable to different industries, it's a problem we have to solve. And I'll share some ideas on that in a minute. And then there's the issue of what's an equitable degree of risk tolerance for impacts on really different dimensions of the ecosystem. It's another fascinating question, and we don't even have fora where we can discuss that, let alone find solutions for it. Now, this is your classic single species, three-stage fisheries model. Some variant of it is used almost everywhere. All hinges on picking a limit reference point where directed fisheries are supposed to be closed and bycatch mitigation measures are in place, and some risk management reference point relative to the limit above which you're managing conventional fisheries frameworks and in between you've got some re rebuilding. This whole framework contains um, six assumptions that make it work. And they're listed here. You don't have to read them. I've got a paper published if you're crazy enough to want to know what they are, you can go download the paper and see what the six assumptions are. The key one is assumption four. Can you identify the position of a limit on an ecosystem feature other than biomass of a population? And it turns out that if you can estimate some productivity measure for the population, or some measure of the ability of that feature to replace itself, or some measure of what ecosystem function is served by that feature. That's all you need to do to generalize this framework. And just like the limit is chosen from stock recruit data almost all the time, sometimes in a really sophisticated model, often something as simple as one way or another using fancy algorithms, fancy language to pick the point on the convex part of the stock recruit curve where the rate of change in the slope is maximum. In reviewing reference points from ICES, Canada, NOAA, and a bunch of other sources, this is in fact what happens. And it makes a lot of sense. This is the, the point at which the rate of change in that slope is maximized. It's exactly the point where you go from having a per capita decrease in spawning stock biomass on a scale to maximum unit, have a less than unit decline in recruitment, to the point where a unit decline in spawning biomass brings a greater than unit decline in recruitment. So it's a logical place to put your limit. So you can ask for any plot of an ecosystem feature 
against its ability to replace itself or the function it serves in the ecosystem, however you can measure that, is there a slope? Is there curvature? And if there is convex curvature, um, where is that position of maximum change? Fit a smoother and then just fit a bunch of tangents and find out where the slope of the tangent changes fastest. This is, whoops, Chris Frid gave me a bunch of data on heteromascus. I'm not even sure what it is. It's something that lives in the sludge and the mud. Um, and an index of its resilience to trawling from studies they've done. And you can fit a Beverton and Holt curve through this, even though it doesn't meet the assumptions of Beverton and Holt in terms of the biology. You can fit just a smoother through it. You can fit an exponential through it. The three different ways to see the curvilinearity of that scatter point give the point of maximum <laughs> change in slope within 3% of each other at around 470 plus or minus um, units of heteromastus per area. This gives us a limit that we can use for regulating the impact of trawling on the benefit community that has the same function back in that three-stage model that the limit reference point in biomass has measuring the direct impact of fisheries. So we can get a long way with existing tools and existing data. The cross-factor challenge is a lot tougher. How to bring consistent management of impacts into very different types of impacts. This is important because governance and decision-making is supposed to be equitable. Um, and at the same eco meeting we had two weeks ago, we at least came up with a list of the types of things that you could begin to investigate for making equitable decisions about impacts across different ecosystem features. Whether it's perturbation, loss of replaceability, loss of functionality, loss of goods and services. But when you put it in a framework where you've got to make decisions, you make decisions based on risk aversion. And the risk aversion is the battlefield of where biodiversity and fisheries management are coming together. Um, it's not an issue of data limitation. It's a difference of tolerance for different kinds of errors. To the ecological community, failing to take conservation action when it should have been taken <coughs> is a really serious problem. And the conservation community and most biologists are very risk intolerant relative to those kinds of errors. To a fishing industry, being closed down or closed out of an area when there actually is no reason to do so is a pretty high cost. And for some reason, they're a little risk averse.